Hi, and welcome to the Vintage Computer Federation YouTube channel. Your support helps us with creating videos just like this one and restoring vintage computers for all the world to enjoy. So please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. Uh, so this talk is not about uh, technology, it's about design, and I, I'm a techie myself, but I don't pretend to know all about graphic design. All I know is that I love seeing good designs and good graphics, uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm really not a designer, I'm just a, a pretender, let's put it this way. Um, and so this is like an homage to people who work in the background of the Techie guys, especially at Apple, you know, we all know the, you know, the big guys. But uh, when it comes to the people who design these iconic logos, I, I thought perhaps, you know, I would uh, do a little bit of an homage to them. So uh, again, we all know these guys, right? You, you all know who this guy is, Steve Jobs. I guess you all know Bosniak. How about this one? Do you guys know what this is? No, so this is Ron Wayne. So he was one of the, uh, the, the three founders at Apple Computer. He actually, he very quickly actually, he withdrew from uh, being one of the co-founders and, and sold his stock, the poor guy. He sold his, I don't know, $10,000 worth of stock, which would be worth billions today. So he's, he's, he's a fairly famous guy too. Uh, Mike Makula was the first CEO, so he was hired as a, as a weathered executive to help Steve Jobs uh, in, in you know, the day-to-day -day, um, running of the company. And also did very well. Great guy. I mean, I don't know him, but I think he, he had a huge influence on, on what Apple is today. And, and this guy, so actually, so is Daniel here today? No, so Daniel Kotke was actually Steve Jobs' roommate at Reed's College and traveled around the world with Steve Jobs, and, and he became the first employee when Steve Jobs was making, and, and Wozniak were making the Apple I in Steve Jobs' garage. He was actually helping putting the Apple I together in the garage. And, you know, he always comes here to these CHM events, uh, a great friend of mine. And so this was a 19, circa 1976 picture from one of the first trade shows that uh, Steve Jobs and Daniel went to, this is in Atlantic City, um, circa 1976, so before Apple was, was the Apple that we know. Uh, but it was, you know, like, so I think these five guys were probably among the first six or seven employees at Apple. And so you know, most of the people in the, you know, in the Silicon Valley know these guys, but, but say, who knows this guy? Who, who here knows who this guy is? Nobody, right? His name is Rob Janoff. What did he do? He designed this. And we'll, we'll talk some more about that. Uh, and by the way, I love this quote from uh, Jean-Louis Gasset. So Jean-Louis Gasset was, a, was an Apple executive. He actually came from Apple France. And I think he ran R&D for a while in, in here in Cupertino. And, and he had this great quote, you couldn't dream of a more appropriate logo, lust, knowledge, hope, and anarchy. And so the lust is, is, you know, Adam and Eve and the apple. Uh, knowledge is Newton's apple. Hope is the rainbow. And, and anarchy is biting the rainbow, bite, biting, biting the, uh, the apple. So I, I think this quote is fantastic. Lust, knowledge, hope, and anarchy kind of summarizes what apple was at the time and per perhaps still is. So that's Rob Janoff. Please remember his name. How about him? So this is actually a recent picture from John Cassado. And John Cassado designed this, also an iconic. Uh, it's called a logo mark. Uh, that's the, the Mac 120, the first Mac. That's the logo that came in all the boxes and the floppies and, and the equipment. And uh, this was actually called the Picasso Mac design by Steve Jobs himself. And, and we'll talk about this, I actually met John Cassado a couple of months ago in, uh, in Burlingame, also extremely nice guy, very down to earth and, and, and very simple guy. Now him, I don't think a lot of people know him except perhaps people who showed up, showed up at that, the booth that we have just uh, around the corner here. He's a Belgian artist, very famous in the 70s and 80s when I was in France. 
in my teens, uh, this guy was, was like a rock star in, 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 in the art. He's a painter, he's, a, he's an illustrator, he's also a sculptor. He passed away in 05. But he was commissioned by Steve Jobs in 83 or so to actually come up with the design for the Mac. Before this design became the design of the Mac, he was commissioned by Steve Jobs to do a, to do a Mac man or Mr. Mac. And uh, so he came up with a couple of designs and we'll talk some more about it. And, and actually I, I'm in touch with the foundation now that, uh, that manages you know, the, the trove of, of arts that he did or in his life. And, and we'll talk some more, but just, just to you know, give you a little tease, you know, the, the early uh, logic boards for the 128, uh, K had uh, that little Mr. Mac or Mac man uh, engraved on the logic board uh, that you can see here. So he designed this uh, and we'll discuss why at the end, you know, Jobs didn't, didn't use him. And who is she? So she's Susan Kerr. And Susan Kerr was an Apple employee. Uh, she actually worked for Apple, uh, contrary to the other three guys. And she did all the uh, 32 by 32 pixel art for uh, uh, you know, icons and, and the like. And this is the Happy Mac, right? Uh, everybody knows the Happy Mac. And um, you know, we'll talk some, I, I didn't, so I contacted her, I purchased some of her um, prints. Uh, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in awe by what she was able to do by just you know, 32 by 32 black and white type of, uh, of pixel art. Uh, and and she, she's, you know, she, she became a name herself right in the, uh, in the art world and the, uh, and the design for computing world. So how did it all start? And I have to mention and acknowledge my friend Mike over there, Mike Moore. It actually started when, um, I was involved with the estate of Chuck Kobe, the founder of Kobe Computer. I gave a talk last year and actually Mike was on stage and also Daniel Kotke, who I just mentioned. Um, and so after we, we refurbished a lot of the Kobe computers and uh, actually Mike organized this giant garage sale uh, at his house in Cupertino. And so we, you know, Mike publicized this quite a bit around, you know, the, the communities and Somehow this guy, I, I took his name off just to be, uh, you know, for, you know, so that you guys not know who he is, but he's, he's a very uh, famous collector of Apple memorabilia in the Middle East region and the Gulf states, um, fairly famous guy. So he sent this email to Mike and he said, hey, I heard that you guys are going to Chuck Kobe estate. Do you guys have this print in the, uh, you know, in what you're selling? And so Mike forwarded that to me and we're scratching our head, you know, why is he interested in this? And it all orig originates from a, a YouTube video uh, that we actually, which, which we knew already of at the time, but you know, it was like a lengthy, an hour or more video. And it was actually, this video was made by the Labor Library of Congress of all people who actually came to Chuck Kobe. So this is Chuck Kobe, the founder of Kobe Computer. Uh, and Kobe Computer was unfortunately a failed uh, Macintosh-based uh, portable computer at the time in the 80s. And this is Chuck Kobe shortly before he passed away. I think he passed away in 2018, and I think that was 2015. And so the Library of Congress came to his house in Palo Alto and interviewed him about his life and everything he's done, all the technical stuff he did. And then at the end, there is this. And I'll let you listen to it. Just fallen, and so we were 
thinking maybe they need a new a new logo. So I had bought this wall hanging at an art store. And um, so we were thinking, well, why don't we use this and, and we'll cut a corner out and put a couple of leaves on top. And that would be a great logo. The problem is, it's got six different colors, and there's never been a corporate logo with six colors ever. That would be really expensive. But Was was able to convince me, he said, Well, where'd you buy this? And I said, At the art store on University Avenue in Palo Alto. So he got back and sent somebody down to buy one, and they showed it to Jobs, and Jobs loved it. And he didn't care that it was going to cost 10 times more to put that logo on all the products because that's the way he was. If he wanted it, he got it. So, so this is the actual one that was here. Um, it, uh, it's still amazing that it hasn't faded. Right, right, right. It, it totally not really well. And when did you buy that? In 76, 75, something like that. Okay. All right, so you get the gist, right? Chuck Kobe has his artwork in his dining room. Uh, Chuck was a friend of Woz, and he claims that back in 76 or something, Woz was at his house with his wife, Candy, and they were talking about Apple needing, needing, needing a, new, uh, a new logo. And then when Woz said this, they said, hey, that would look great, and we make it in the shape of an apple, and we carve a bite on the side and then put a leaf on top and that's going to become the logo. And he said that was bought at the University Arts Store in Palo Alto. In your house, bro. So, so would the Apple logo be, you know, inspired by this piece of art that was popular in the 70s? And, you know, when you look at it, uh, the colors are almost exactly the same except for the blue. Uh, the order is slightly different, uh, that the Apple logo has the green on the top. But even the color, uh, you know, it's almost like a circular permutation, right? But the, the color order is actually not the rainbow color order, as you know. And um, yeah, just flipping the, the green to the top and changing the blue a little bit to make it a little lighter. So, you know, you would think, well, maybe there's some there's some truth to this, right? It, it, it could be, you know, quite possible that, that somehow Jobs was inspired by this piece of art and, and created the logo from that, uh, with or without Wozniak's help. So, so I was very intrigued by that. And um, actually, the first thing I did was to purchase a, a similar piece of artwork, exactly the same from the same period of time. I bought this on eBay with the help of a friend of mine, Boris, I don't know if he's here, maybe he's not. Um, but so now we have this beautiful piece in, in our uh, office at home. And then I did a lot of research. Where did that piece of art come from? And I was, that was arduous, but, but uh, I think I found it. It's, so the name is Super Dart. Its name, uh, uh, it's made by a manufacturer in Sweden called Stroma. Uh, it was very popular at, in the 70s doing, you know, this wide print, very, you know, hippie-ish type of print. Um, so that was made in Sweden in a town called Norrköping. And I even found the name of the artist who I'm trying to communicate with. I think she's still around in Stockholm. Uh, but so far, I've not been able to communicate with her. And the date, probably early 70s, but I could not nail the, the exact date for that piece, so, so this is where it was made. And by the way, IKEA in 2013 actually took the similar design with slightly different colors and made prints for uh, furniture with it. Um, and by the way, we found slightly different color, but so the same color as these in some early photos from Chuck Kobe himself. At the time he had you know, the Kobe computer company in his house. And there was a second piece that he owned that was here with a slightly different colors. You know, the same tone that you see here with a red to brown to yellow. 
And by the way, he used these colors. You don't see it very well here, but uh, this, this was a booth that Kobe had at a trade show for, you know, computing trade show back in the 80s. And, you know, be, behind the, uh, the Mac Kobe, which was one of the Kobe's computer, you can see that, that same print here that he had here. So clearly Kobe liked that, that design. He used it in his whole marketing campaign. And um, yeah, and he claims that this was the, the inspiration for the uh, rainbow, Apple rainbow logo, which if it's true, you know, cr you know create a completely different lore to this, uh, the origin of this, uh, this logo. And, and I think for the whole Silicon Valley, you know, that would kind of change a little bit of the landscape of, of the, the whole history of, uh, of the logos at Apple. So I did some more research. So Bill Kelly was the, the design manager at uh, the company called Regis, Regis McKenna. That was an advertising company that Steve Jobs liked to hire. So, and this was, this is an account actually I found on the uh, computer, um, the network, sorry, the um, internet archive. This is actually not published anymore, but uh, so Bill Kelly had his own website and he had this on it with photos of Steve Jobs uh, at uh, circa 1977 meeting with Regis McKenna when they came with the Apple II and they said, hey, we need a logo. Can you guys make a logo for us? And so what, uh, what Bill says is that first we designed the logo, that is Rob Janoff designed it, the guy I showed you with the curly hair, uh, an apple with a bite out of it, uh, indicating knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So initially the uh, logo was to be simple, but the Apple II advantage at the time was color. And so Jobs argued that the logo should have colors. And of course, of course, he won. And Jobs ended up actually specifying several of the colors of the logo. So that kind of lead, leads some credence to this, right? Is that perhaps, you know, the, the apple with the bite was Regis McKenna and Rob Janov, but then, but then the colors were dictated by Steve Jobs, who perhaps had knowledge of this art piece. So that's perhaps, uh, you know, a, a story that kind of makes sense. Unfortunately, I was able to reach out directly to Rob Janoff, you know, the design artist who claims that he actually was a designer, and, and he did say that. He said, no, that was all me. And, you know, on a, I pass on all uh, the details of what he says, but basically what he said is, no, no, that was all me. I also reached out to Bill Kelly, who was Rob Janoff's boss, and he hedged his bet a little bit compared to what he said here. What he said here was Steve Jobs ended up uh, specifying several of the colors. And here he says that, um, you know, at the request of, of uh, Steve Jobs, Rob put stripes on the logo with colors. And then unfortunately, Steve liked it, even though the McKenna guys didn't really like it, but Steve liked it and it could not be argued out of it. But he still said that they went back and forth over days to picking the colors. So there is, you know, about the same story as before, right? So that the bite and the apple was them, and then the colors perhaps had a lot of influence from Steve Jobs. So there's a, yet another guy who was, who, who um, Kobe said he was there in the room uh, when they had the divine inspiration, and it was Wozniak himself, and. I didn't try to reach out to Wozniak myself, but I have a good friend of mine. Her, her name is Danielle Martel. She's not here today, but she knows Woz, and she offered that she could actually be the uh, intermediary to ask the question to Woz himself, which is what I did. So I, I sent the question to her, she forwarded it to Woz, and he replied within a, a two days, which was remarkable. And he said that he never saw the artwork. And so that was a bit of a disappointment. So that's all we have here. You know, he said, well, Steve Jobs and I were totally surprised by the presentation along with other logos. He does say though that the, you know, the, the colors were not, not exactly in the same order and they had to rearrange the order. So there was still a little bit of a influence from Jobs and, and perhaps Wozniak. He said something interesting though. He said that my only exposure to multicolor logo was the one for Ampex. And as you might know, Ampex was a company from the 50s and 60s that did a lot of magnetic recording on tapes and things of that nature. And so, you know, keep this in mind because I actually I did find a logo from Ampex that, that could actually uh, land some, you know, be a, 
maybe a missing dot between all this. So, so that's where I kind of stopped my research. And I think at the end, I still think that jobs probably had a huge influence on the, the choice of the colors. Almost certainly the apple and the bite was Regis McKenna and Rob Janoff. So the, the last question really is who had the original inspiration for the colors and did that came from the art piece? I still think it's possible. I would maybe put it a 50-50 chance that it did happen, uh, but we'll, we'll never know for sure. Uh, I did reach out to the people at the University Art Center, in, which was formerly in Palo Alto. On, it was actually not on University Avenue, but it was on Hamilton Avenue. And I reached out to them and I said, hey, do you remember carrying this piece? And they said, no, we don't remember carrying this particular piece, but, uh, but we carried uh, very similar pieces. And it's very likely that we had that piece in our, in our store. So, so clearly, this piece was bought from the University Art Center in 77, 78, perhaps. And, and it, again, it is possible that it was inspiration for the colors of the uh, Apple you know, rainbow logo, but we'll never know for sure. Uh, but who knows, maybe we'll have some you know, more news, and, and maybe I'll give you an update next year. And then, you know, after all this, a friend of mine says, hey, look at this uh, YouTube video. So this is an interview of uh, Steve Jobs in his office, uh, circa 1981. So three years or two and a half years before the launch of the Macintosh. And this is Steve Jobs. And look, look on the wall. So this is the actual apple with the bite. You can actually, it's, the bite is right here. But you can see the leaf here, and this is, this is the apple, not, not this piece, but, but the shape and the size is almost exactly the same as this. And the border is white and it's all in a square. And you know, it's uncanny to look at two of them and say, hey, you know, it has to be somehow connected. So you know, whether or not Steve Jobs, and by the way, Steve Jobs at the time was not yet in Palo Alto, or maybe he was, I kind of forgot. But uh, you know, he certainly had access to this art center and certainly was into this type of art from the 70s. And so, like I said, I, I would think perhaps he, he knew of this art piece, and perhaps this art piece was the inspiration for the colors. And, um, but we'll, you know, we don't know for sure today. So, and by the way, you know, when Chuck Kobe said uh, at the time there was never a six color uh, logo, uh, that was not true. So we found this, and again, Boris is not here, find this for me. That was the logo for the magnetic tape for Apex. And this is exactly the same colors uh, as the, uh, the, you know, the, that Swedish uh, super dot. So this almost for sure was inspired by the super dot, and it's exactly what Bosniak said. Bosniak said, my only exposure to a six color logo was Apex, and he probably referred to this. And so is it possible that Ampex got inspired by this piece from Sweden, which then you know, Apple uh, also copied? Uh, again, we'll never know. But, but by the way, Polaroid in 62 came up with a logo fairly similar to this. And so you know, there, was a, there were companies doing multicolor logos, unlike what uh, Steve, um, Chuck Kobe said. And NBC did uh, another rainbow logo, Microsoft, kind of similar, Google also. And the reason why I say S3 here, Esprit logo is also multicolor, kind of the same type of trend. And who designed the Esprit logo? John Casado, who designed uh, you know, the Macintosh uh, Picasso logo. So I met, I met John a couple of months ago, maybe a month or two ago, in, uh, uh, near the airport uh, in Burlingame. Uh, he has ex actually an, an exposition there, an exhibit of his art uh, at, at an art store. Um, we spent an hour talking about you know, the logo, I asked him, hey, how was Steve Jobs when he saw this logo? Was he happy? And he paused for a minute and he said, you know, it's not really Steve Jobs to be happy and say, good job. No, Steve Jobs said, thanks. <laughs> and that was it. And that became you know, the iconic um, logo. By the way, which, which, which one is the, right, the, the logo that everybody knows? Is that the left or the right? So who said the logo is the, the one on the right hand side? No, who said the logo is the one on the left? Yes, yeah, so that's the one. <laughs> Good job, guys. Uh, and then John said, I made a mistake, because the, the mouse should be on the right hand side. <laughs> but no, the mouse is on the left. And that's the, that's the logo on the left. And so the other thing that's 
kind of famous for people who know the, you know, the Apple lore is that Steve Jobs called it the Picasso logo, but John says, no, the inspiration was not Picasso, but Matisse. And you know, Picasso was a Spanish painter. He, he died in the 90s, I think, perhaps. Uh, Matisse, maybe, uh, was a French painter, but also doing a lot of art, uh, you know, single line artwork. And he was using this huge uh, uh, stick to do his art. Um, so it was actually inspired by Matisse, not Picasso, but everybody talks about the Picasso design. And, and that, came, that was coined by Steve Jobs. So yeah, so this Picasso design became ubiquitous for the early, uh, the, the 128K and the 512K models of the Mac. And uh, it, you know, today you can buy the original Macintosh with the box and with all the accessories. And if you look at the accessories, you know, they have all the, the sub-design of the keyboard. Um, this is the mouse. There's even uh, a power cord somewhere. And also Apple did a lot of um, marketing uh, accessories that they would give to the Apple store owners. And we have at our table here, just behind the wall, we have this uh, lamp. There's a fluorescent light under this beautiful beveled glass art piece. And also beautiful, so the same, you know, same design, but on a, on a gorgeous um, poster with original um, frame. And we also have one back there. So that's the story of the, uh, the Picasso logo. And by the way, so also John told me that he only designed these things. These were original, and he actually did one for the, the Lisa that was converted. As you know, Lisa was, was pre-Macintosh, but then they rebranded the Lisa into a Mac Excel. So, so the Lisa became the Macintosh, part of the Macintosh line. And so he, he did also the design for the, uh, the, the Mac Excel. But there was a lot of copycats, so everybody thinks that the, uh, you know, the design for the box of the numeric keypad was from him, and he said, no, no, I didn't do that, and you know, some other people did at Apple. And he said, you can tell by the, the thickness of the line, which is thinner than his lines himself. The same for the external floppy drive, he didn't des design it. Even the Mac Paint, Mac Wright, he didn't design it. Uh, wheels for the mine, somebody came to our table this morning to talk about this. And, and also, we have this, this Mac Invest software at our table, which is copycat for sure. <laughs> they even took the, the Apple. I don't know whether they had authorization from Apple, but this was just a, an app uh, uh, vendor uh, just doing some, some Macintosh software and, and copying, blatantly copying the, in, that design. Actually, I think Picasso said, uh, some, somebody said great artist copy or something. And so, yeah, the piece of art is so good that, you know, the, the best artists actually copy because they know it's good. So, so that's the type of work. And, you know, John is a great guy. So if, you can, if you're in Burlingame, go see the Andrew Noras Gallery. He has some of his um, portraits over there. And, uh, and, and again, so that was him and me a couple of months ago, maybe a month, month and a half ago in, in that gallery. Uh, and he was gracious enough to actually sign some of my, uh, some of my uh, Picasso, Apple Picasso stuff. And so the one we have here at our booth is, is actually signed by him, which is great. Um, so really, really nice guy. So, but before, so before John Casado did this Picasso design, um, there's a story that you can read in some of the uh, Apple story, books, so there's a Apple Confidential 2.0, a book by Owen Linsmeyer. Uh, whoops, and they say this, long before the Mac was complete, Steve Jobs had become quite taken with the work of Belgian-born poster artist Jean-Michel Follon, and pay him an advance of 30 grand to design a logo to represent the new computer. Follon came up with a character he called Mac-Man, and depicted him in a color pastel drawing called the Macintosh Spirit. So um, I would venture to think that perhaps this um, magazine cover from 82, this is an, a magazine, a French magazine for you know, Apple people, circa 1982, and that was a cover. And so this artist, Jean-Michel Fonon, was super famous at the time, was a rock star, like, like I said, in France and in Europe in general. 
and he made this, you know, for Apple. And I, I would surmise to say that perhaps Steve Jobs saw this and said, hey, this is the guy I need to talk to to do a design for my, for my Macintosh. Uh, but, you know, we wouldn't know for sure. Um, and so there's also a story you can read on the, you know, the folklore, Apple folklore. Um, Andy Hertzfeld, who was, you know, the chief uh, software architect for, for Apple and Mac, he, he talks about uh, Follon himself, and so Follon was invited a couple of times to the uh, Cupertino campus, and probably was the first artist to start playing with uh, Mac Paint, and, and do probably the very first piece of art on a uh, you know digital um, uh, digital support, and that was that was the Mac, an Apple Mac, and, and a little guy who looks like typical Follon guys biting the Mac. And then he even said, hello, Andy, or something, and he signed it. So I, I think Andy Hertzfeld still has this uh, you know, huge historical value, uh, little piece of paper uh, that was printed on a dot matrix printer at the time, uh, but signed by Follon. I think, again, when it comes to the history of, and the lore of you know, Apple stuff, uh, this is uh, precious. And this is discussed. You can go online and find this. And pretty much that's all was known of, of the whole project with this artist. A couple of pins which come from the Digibarn, you can find online. And then, like I said, um, you know, the circuit board, the early prototype circuit boards had that little Mr. Mac or Mac Man on it. And the poster. So these are the only four pieces I know from this artist to Apple in the early 80s. And this is a poster that we have here. I have one of the original posters that was given to the Apple employees. I bought it about eight years ago online uh, on Craigslist from a former Apple employee. And this is the Macintosh spirit. So this, you know, that was supposed to be the logo, you know, with a man kind of flying, you know, in outer space with, uh, you know, heads represented by a Mac and a, holding a keyboard and, you know, with a, with a mouse floating in midair. And uh, I only know of another copy of this. And so as far as I know, there's only two copies of this that are known today. There's mine and then one that I've sold uh, several years ago that you can find on uh, you know, some uh, auction um, places. So uh, again, historically, I think this is very rare. And those pins, same thing, right? I think the only two known pins that I know are at the GD barn, Digi Barn, uh, which many of you probably know of. And I would love to put my hands on this logic board, by the way. So if you have one like this, it's probably worth a lot of money. So don't throw it away. Or give it to me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, but unfortunately, after Follon submitted the Macintosh period, the, uh, the mercurial jobs changed his mind. And in June 83, he turned instead to the Mac art director, Tom Hughes, asking him to come up with something a little more practical. And by the way, yeah, I, I was told by uh, John Casado that this is very hard to use as a logo because it doesn't have a lot of contrast and you cannot really print this on a, on a box very easily. And so, you know, his, his Picasso design was much, much more practical, which is what, what they say here. So working with John Casano, you created the colorful, simple drawing of the mag that we've come to know and love. So again, this is a quote from Owen Linsmeyer. So, I was able to get in touch with the Follon Foundation. So since French is my first language, uh, so I went to these um, people and they're all in uh, the French part of Belgium. And I wrote to them and I said, hey, you know, I'm gonna give a talk on the, you know, the uh, Apple logos and you might not even know, you know, uh, Follon passed away 05, so that was almost 20 years ago, 17 years ago. And so people who work in the foundation, none of them actually knew that uh, that Follon had this connection with Apple. So they were very interested in, in hearing about it. Uh, and I said, hey, would you have any sketches or you know, prints or notes from the artists corresponding to this, uh, this connection with Apple? And um, so for those of you who can read French, this is what they wrote. We are in fact very interested by your research. The connection between Apple and Follon is fascinating and we always wanted to know more. So we have here a few pre-project uh, proofs by Follon and some archives. 
that we will um, very happily share with you. Uh, I need to do some research, but I'll get back to you. And then she got back to me two weeks later, and I said, here are the documents, and she sent me a link to those high-resolution uh, prints, maybe 30 of them, uh, by Forlon. Gorgeous. And stuff that was never published or seen before, which you will witness today. And she said, I think that will be of interest to you, and I'm very curious to see, you know, the, you know to follow your, your research and your conclusions. Great help. I was so happy. And, you know, historically speaking, this is fantastic. I believe these are scribbled notes by the artist himself, probably either a face-to-face -face meeting with Jobs or a phone call with Jobs, where he says, okay, I need to come up with a Mac man, a visual symbol image for magazines and television or pamphlets. And even, you know, started to sketch a little, you know, Mac man. And so I believe that was um, contemporary to, you know, the very early Apple 82, 83 time frame, probably a phone call with Jobs, which, you know, as a historian of vintage computing to me is, is fascinating. Uh, and then he also sketched the box where, you know, the, the Mac would eventually be, where a box would have smaller boxes in it, which is exactly what, what happened, with a keyboard box and a mouse box, and the Mac man would be on the side. And we all know that at the end, the Mac man was never on the side. It was uh, instead the, uh, the, the Picasso logo. And a trove of Mac Mans and sketches and such, which, again, have never been seen before. Uh, and so the the overarching common denominator to all this is rainbow colors and Mac man uh, and some, you know, the, the very simple design that Fodon was very famous for. Uh, so, you know, Mac man, Macintosh, Macintosh, etc. you know, various, you know, ideas coming out of his mind. Uh, the rainbow apple here in, in, in the brain. And then I come to the shape of the eyes later on, which I think is a bit interesting. You know, same thing, right? Arrows coming out of the brain, multicolor, the apple here. You know, the Macintosh here. I'm not sure what this is. If it's, uh, I don't know, a camera or something that he's holding. Rainbow coming out of his head, Mac Man. And then various Mac Man sketches. And, you know, one of them ended up as a button that is at the Gigi bar. Uh, but these were, you know, multiple version and sketches of, of that Mac man. Some of them, you know, very crude, some of them more finished. And so this is the Mac man that you can find online at the, Digi, uh, at the Digibarn. And, you know, we found this one, which was the, the twin brother, really. Uh, you don't really have the, the really true rainbow colors here, but, you know, it's, it's you know, the twin brother. Uh, and again, this has never been seen before today. And it's a beautiful one, very finished one. Perhaps he was hoping this one would make it as, as the symbol of the Mac and, uh, and never made it. Uh, and perhaps this one too, the Mac man with stuff coming out of the set. So the mysterious shape of the eye here um, that, that we, you know, we find in almost half of the sketches had this symbol here. Here, 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 down here, like little mushrooms, key, key for a keyhole. And so I asked the foundation, I said, hey, do you have any idea what this is? You know, I see this, you know, in all the prints. What is it? And they said, well, we were hoping you would tell me. <laughs> so at first I thought it kind of looked like the, um, the floppy drive of the Macintosh. And I thought, that must be the floppy drive. But then I talked to some of my friends and they said, mm, I don't think so. And somebody told me that must be, uh, that must be uh, a, a, a via on, on a circuit board. And you know, when, it, when you see via on a circuit board, you say, ah, that's, that's what it is. So I don't know whether Follow himself had the idea or maybe Jobs told Follow, hey, maybe a via or a through hole on a circuit board could be a good you know, way to kind of uh, work this. Uh, but, but I think this is, uh, this is it. And by the way, CHM, <laughs> here, the logo has those uh, circuit board uh, vias as well in their own logo. So, so uh, yeah, so people here probably know all about 
about that. So that's really all for Folon. So um, yeah, that was that was uh, that was actually a lot of fun to do this, uh, and and communicating with the foundation was was just gorgeous, and and uh, and so I, I'd like to talk about Susan Kerr because she's also part of the whole lore about you know the Apple and, and the design. Uh, I have not communicated with her like I communicate with everybody else so far. Uh, but I think she deserves to be in this presentation because uh, just as an homage to what she's done, I think she's done some incredible work. Just coming up with an icon based on just a 32 by 32 little square with just two colors, black or white. She also came up with this uh, gorgeous uh, print or you know artwork with a, this Japanese lady, which was actually used for marketing of the Mac Paint program. She, she, she came up with that, and she came up with all the, all the icons, of course. And, um, and so, yeah, so when, when the Mac became Mac Plus, so there was Mac 128K, then Mac 1, then Mac 512K, and then the Mac Plus. So the Mac Plus changed the design. They got away with the, uh, the Picasso logo, and they came up with the uh, artwork by Susan Kerr. So the Mac Plus. All the floppies have this artwork now, and in my collection, you know, I, I just scanned quite a few. And it's remarkable, again, that by just a 32 by 32 art piece, you can, you can portray almost anything. My favorite is the Macintosh Pascal here, uh, because you can see, again, just 32 by 32. You can see two hands, you can see a keyboard, and you can see a flowchart. And you, you recognize everything. Um, and so, yeah, kudos for what she's done. And, you know, the develop, develop, development system, 68K development system with a, this beautiful artwork on a parchment paper with zeros and ones also, I think, is, is beautiful. Um, so, anyway, kudos to her and, and homage to her. And she really deserves uh, recognition as one of the true graphic artists of the Apple era. So, and then this one that I love that was Steve, Steve Jobs. On 32 by 32, and I said to myself, how difficult could it be, right? I just take a Steve Jobs photo. So I, I tried to do this, but just in a very methodical fashion using you know, software, and I said, there has to be a way to do something like this, right? So I took Steve Jobs' head here and uh, converted to a grayscale, then remove the shoulders, and then convert to black and white. So, so far I said, hey, yeah, yeah, black and white, I still see Steve Jobs. And then I said, okay, so now all I need to do is to resample this picture into a 32 by 32. And then, you know, every block will be the average. And it's, if it's more white, it's going to be white. If it's more black, it's going to be black. And so that's, we'll have to come up with something close to Steve Jobs. <laughs> and this is what I got. <laughs> so clearly, you know, it's just not as simple as this. And clearly, there's an artistic touch, right, that you have to have in order to do this type of thing. And, and, and again, kudos to her. Oh, by the way, the only thing I got right was the angle of the, uh, you know, the hair here on the forehead. And that's pretty much the only thing I got right. <laughs> but yeah, that's, it, again, it's an homage to what she's done, right? It is much more than just doing, you know, a few conversions of, you know, graphic formats. And by the way, you know, a shout out to what she does. So you can go, she has a website. You can actually buy some of her art. Uh, I don't know if it's susancare.com or something, but you can Google her, you'll find her. And you can buy the Happy Mac, you can buy, you know, the, the Sad Mac, you can buy a bunch of her art. Of her art. And they're all signed and numbered. Uh, so she limits the uh, print to 200 copies. And so I recently bought uh, a few of the, uh, of the Happy Macs. Um, and, and yeah, um, please um, consider doing this. Uh, I, think, uh, I think she's an integral part of the lore of uh, you know, design work in the Valley. And that concludes my talk. So there's a, a lot of people I'd like to acknowledge. So that's probably gonna take another five minutes, but uh, everybody deserves a great acknowledgement. So Mike Moore is my only uh, uh, Kobe. So I call these people the Kobe Amigos. So we were involved with uh, Chuck Kobe's, you know, Kobe Computer Estate in the last two or three years, gave a talk here last year. Um, you know, along the way, I met some great people, and, and Mike is here, one of them. And so Mike is the one who organized the uh, 
the garage sale in this driveway and and from that we got in touch with a lot of interesting people and that really led me to start working on trying to understand the origin of the Apple logo. Uh, Paul Stefan was the guy who actually knew Chuck Kobe and posted that video uh, that I showed on uh, YouTube. And by the way, this video was supposed to be made by the uh, Library of Congress, uh, but I communicated with the Library of Congress and they have no clue where this video is and it's not posted on the website. And so as a taxpayer, you know, you can't help but feel a bit uh, cheated by, <laughs> by that. Uh, so the only no known a copy of this video is on YouTube and was posted by Paul Stefan. So if Paul wasn't, he you know, wasn't here, we would probably not know about all this. Chuck Kobe himself, who I didn't meet, but I, I met his wife, Karen, great woman. She, she's in Fresno, she's still around, great woman. Clay Mannard, I met him, was a, a good friend of uh, Kobe's, so I met him too. Oops. And Daniel Kotke, I was hoping would make it here, but he was also involved in helping us in the, uh, the Kobe estate. And Danielle Martel, she was introduced to me by uh, Danielle himself. Uh, she was also part of the Homebrew Computer Club. And so she, she, that's how she met uh, Woz and a number of people. And she's now become a good friend of mine. Uh, she, she's the one who put me in touch with uh, Wozniak. By the way, she has a, a beautiful uh, Lisa II uh, signed by Woz and, and Larry Tesler and a bunch of other people. So if you're interested uh, in knowing more, uh, let me know. Internet Archive, great facility. Rob Janoff was very gracious to communicate with me. Same with Bill Kelly, his boss. University Art communicated with me about this art piece. Uh, nice people too. So a lot of what I said about John Casado and the, um, and the design, the Picasso design, actually I learned it from the Vintage Mac Museum website. It was run by somebody who passed away. Unfortunately, his name was Adam Rosen. And he actually did a lot of groundwork, also working with John Casado, but 10 years ago. And uh, so Adam Rosen was a MIT graduate, uh, and he was from the Boston area. And he had a great website with a lot of Macintosh and Apple lore. So uh, shout out to him uh, and uh, rest in peace. And then, you know, if you're in the bowling game area, please go check out the Andra Norris Gallery when John Casado exhibits some of his works. Fondation Follon, Follon Foundation, super helpful. DigiBarn, great people also. And then of course, um, Computer History Museum for hosting this and VCF. And that's all, thanks. So I guess there's time for Q&A, so. No, no lead on this, unfortunately. No, pretty much everything I know, I just told you, unfortunately. <laughs> so, and again, I'm not a design guy, right? I'm just a techie, and I, I did this for fun, and I don't pretend that I know everything. So, sorry, no. There was another. No? Okay. Yeah, I'd say I really love this Picasso design and I have so many of them and you know this original um, lamp display, it's just gorgeous, you know, the, uh, the glass piece and also the poster, it's just gorgeous stuff and it's so simple, I just love it yeah, and that's, that would be my favorite piece. Yeah. Yeah, so I, we, all, we all know that Apple Records sued Apple Computer, right? And, and we all know that they eventually settled. Um, beyond this, on the logo side, I, I, I don't know of any no, uh, litigation or anything. By the way, uh, yeah, so the, the, the Funnel Foundation wanted to approve of you know, me showing all this, which, which I did, and, and they wanted me to put the logo on it. 
and you know, uh, rightfully so, right? Uh, so, uh, but yeah, no. So other than that, no, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, so I think you all read all these books, right? Uh, Steve Jobs, she, he worked in an apple farm in uh, Oregon when he was at Reed, or af after he, after he uh, dropped out of Reed, yeah, he worked in an apple farm and, and lived there for a while, and I think maybe that's even where he met his, the, mo the mother of his daughter, right? Uh, and I think that's why he, he called it Apple Computer, but you guys probably know more, but it's in all the books there. Uh, and Macintosh is a type of Apple, right? It's spelled differently. Yeah. And, and you know, he wanted to call uh, the Macintosh the, the bicycle first. And because, the, yeah, there's a great interview of Steve Jobs. He wants to make a point that everybody at some point will have a computer at home. And he kind of compares the bicycle to the computer. And he said, you know, people did some research of how much energy it takes, you know, to go from point A to point B. And he compares the man to you know a rabbit to a horse, and he says of all the mammals and and the animals that we know on Earth, you know the most efficient that takes the fewest number of joules per kilometer or something, is the albatross. Uh, but then he said once the bicycle was inv invented, then the bicycle and the man beat the albatross by orders of magnitude. So so by you know by clever design you can actually beat nature. And so he thought perhaps the computer would help your mind just like the bicycle helps your, your legs. Yeah. yeah, I know Escher, yeah. Hey. You know, it's interesting because when I, when I did that, all, all of a sudden I noticed that the logo, the, the Apple logo was on the left. And that's the, you know, that's the only floppy I have with the Apple logo on the left. And yeah, that, that kind of, has a little Escher, no, those stairs that go up and, uh, and go down, and is, is that what you're talking about? Okay. Okay, well, good, good comment there. Any other questions? All right, thank you.